Dabs the dog. Thank you so much. Sorry for the brief interruption. So this, this is a, a sign in a barbershop in Dublin, Ireland. If you can't see, it's kind of cursive. It's cut and sew. And one of my colleagues in Pittsburgh, a pediatric cardiac surgeon, Brick Morell, said, cutting and sewing, just cutting and sewing. And that's what you got to learn to do. And so you guys have a new pediatric cardiac surgeon here, Pranava Sinha, who's, who's also one of those guys who can cut and sew. So uh, a couple of my <clears throat> mentors, Jorgensen, or the surgeon says, I've done it this 20, 30, 50 years, whatever. Um, and he says, if you say that, or people say that, that means they're not improving. They're not getting better. You always have to be getting better and doing something different and advancing. Another one of my mentors, Phil Gazetta, uh, said, if someone says, I've never had that complication, probably means they just haven't done enough of those cases. So those are things to, to remember and, and keep in your mind. <clears throat> so how do we train? So Training surgeons is about getting an experience and volume, volume, volume. And so that, that includes time and effort. And in a book called The Sports Team by David Epstein, uh, he states that it takes at least 10,000 hours to become proficient at anything. That's a musical instrument, surgery, it's just the time spent. You can't talk surgery and, and be good. You have to actually do it. So you have to get in there and get in the game. So what we talk about, I'm not going to pronounce his name, but the state of flow, when you get in an operation, you, you're just there. You don't know that two hours went by, three hours, you're kind of in the zone. Like being an athlete, you're in a game and you just don't know time's going by, you're just playing and, and really just uh, concentrating. And whether Teddy Roosevelt's your good brother, wear out or rust out, who knows when you should retire, or hang up the scalpel or fade out or burn away like Neil Young tells us. And so when you think about innovation, this is from the movie Moneyball. The first one through the wall always gets bloody. And you, you can, I certainly had these experiences where you try something new and it may not work, but you know, you just pick yourself up and keep going and, and always be humble. So pediatric surgery, it, it's a field of many conditions, rare in number, many different body cavities. So how do you get experience in infrequent cases? And again, this speaks to volume. You get volume and experience overall breadth of experience. And sometimes you need to seek out experts for things that you haven't done. And, and that may not be a pediatric surgeon, it may be a thoracic surgeon, an MIS surgeon, a hepatobiliary surgeon that's not in your field. So going to meetings that are not in your specialty like SAGES or ACS, you learn a lot from, from, from our colleagues. So I've always been a slow learner. I, I, on. For those who don't know, it's 10 events, track and field, and you have to do every one. So if you're not a great shot putter, you know, you got to take the score you get for the shot put. But pediatric surgery, many conditions, many body cavities, you can specialize, not for trauma or things that you have to do all the time, but if you, there's elective things you can decide not to do if, if you so choose. So I was always interested in MIS and training with Keith Jorgensen. He basically, you know, did everything that way or at least thought about it. And, but pedi uh, pediatric surgery, MIS, was lagging behind our adult colleagues. In the late 80s, um, lap coles were coming into vogue in the adult world, but it was really the mid 90s to early 2000s that MIS and P's kind of caught on. In the early 2000s, there was still half people doing lap pylorics and half doing open, and um, things have caught up. But right now, neonatal MIS surgery is definitely still lagging behind. There's only 10% of US surgeons do a thoracoscopic TEF. And I used to think that we can train everybody up, everyone's going to do it. But then I, I've, I've cert, since changed that view. I think you know, not everybody needs to do it. Um, there are so many combination of factors that go into doing a successful case like that. Difficult case, infrequent, um, very, very small patients. It takes anesthesiologists, it takes a lot of teamwork. So it's okay to, to not do it. So 
you have on a basketball team, you have to have people that can dunk and people that can hit a three. So it's okay. I was always interested in flexible endoscopy. We used to do rigid um, endoscopy to get foreign bodies out. And if anybody's done that, it's, you're looking in a, in a hole and there's no, no visualization. You kind of see the outline of a penny or a fishbone or something and you grab it. And so I started doing flexible endoscopy and it was very much easier. And I've done a few duodenal webs, which is a case where you can just cut the web with a sphincter tome, apolotomy blade. And in the late 2000s, I tried to do some pylorics with an endoscopic balloon until I extubated a couple of kids and I got shut down by the anesthesiologist. So those are things, you know, you get informed consent by saying, hey, we, we can try it this way, but if we don't convert to the usual way, it's laparoscopic. And I was always uh, intrigued by the um, poem technique for achalasia and first started reading about it in 2008 when it was being done in, uh, in the lab. But achalasia again is a rare thing, one in one million in kids, uh, 10 per 100,000 prevalence. And so in 2013, I decided I'm gonna try to learn how to do this. So we went out to Oregon and Lee Swanstrom was getting a course on poem. Uh, he had a lab with, uh, with pig, pig models and also had a, um, Case, case presentations that we observed. And I took my newly minted fellow who just became an, uh, a first year faculty and we learned how to do it. And then we couldn't get the equipment until 2015. So two years later, um, as everyone knows that the most in kids, the most definitive treatment for achalasia is myotomy. So whether that's a lap heller with or without an anti-reflux procedure or a poem, that's the way to go. So we attempted our first case in 2015. We had an adult proctor who had done some with a GI colleague, not much help. Um, we basically you know, cut the mucosa, tried to get in, couldn't do it, just clipped it and did a lap heller. And so how do you get informed consent in cases like that? These are more rhetorical questions. So initially we'd say, we're gonna do, uh, do the poem procedure. If we can't do it, we're gonna convert to a lap heller. And pretty much everyone says, okay, that's fine. And so that's kind of what you need to do, but you have to be very honest and forthright with the patients as to what your uh, skill level is and what your knowledge base is and what your uh, track record is. And someone's gonna ask you, how many have you done? This is just a, a slide showing the number of MIS uh, cases in pediatric achalasia. And just, this is just to outline that there, there are not many, some of these series have patients, but there are three different institutions. And, and the last one on the slide is, our publication in 2016, where we showed 35 patients. Um, and that was actually our first two poem patients were included in that series. So that was considered a very large series, but as you, as you can see, it's not that many patients. So most of, at most during that time, we were doing lap hellers with doors. I can tell you on the last 15 hellers we've done, we've done no doors. We can talk about that later, but the poem is an entirely endoscopic procedure. Uh, Parisha at Hopkins had developed this in animals, and Haru Inouye first clinically uh, and uh, described, coined the term. Initial concerns in pediatrics were, is it feasible? Is it, is it um, and some of this relates to size, kids are, are not all the same size, uh, but poem cases have increased in children. So again, this is basically failure of LES relaxation, absent peristalsis, high, high LES pressure zone, and uh, spastic esophageal contractions. So we flip, and interesting about the device is it measures the, the uh, GE junction as well as the distensibility of the esophagus. And you can tailor your myotomy. We use it in hellers and poems to determine how long to cut the muscle. And, uh, and it's a very, very useful aid. And, and a, a man named uh, John Daly developed this in his garage in Galway, Ireland. We met him at a meeting, at a soft geo meeting, came and brought us the device and he was recently bought out by Medtronic, so he's, he's, he's doing well. Um, so we use the cross-sectional area of the, of the uh, GE junction as well as the distensibility to, to show what it is. And this is just a picture of the balloon where it looks like an hourglass before you do your myotomy. It looks more like a, a waist there. Um, those little bars on the markings are about um, a, millimeter, uh, a centimeter in, in length. There's no real norms in kids for the diameter, but we want to get into double figures. When you do a, um, an endoflip balloon, you'll see you know, four millimeters, six millimeters, this tiny hole. You want it to be 10 or 11. And distensibilities above three are typically what you want to get. And distensibility is basically the cross-sectional area of the esophagus. 
related to the pressure required to open the GE junction, and that's inflating the balloon. So it's not a dilator, it's just a, a measuring device. So in terms of the steps for poem, you want it uh, in the blue area here, your coastal tunnel is about 10 centimeters long above the GE junction, and they're typically six to seven centimeters long. <clears throat> so you insert the scope, the scope has a dissecting cap on it. You make a submucosal wheel, and you do mucosotomy with either a knife or an Irby blade. I'll show a short video here to demonstrate this as well. So, so tunnel, what you'll see is that on the left side here, you're, this is pointer here. Yeah, the submucosa kind of gets stained by the methylene blue that you inject and the muscle doesn't. So the muscle's on the right and that's how you keep your orientation during the procedure. We usually cut the muscle from distal or proximal and we re reinsert the end of flip balloon to see if we've done an, an adequate myotomy. And this is a, just a picture of the endoflip balloon through the GE junction. And again, the goal is above 10 millimeters or double figures basically. And then their sensibility is gonna be above three typically. If we do this after the myotomy, it's not, not long enough, doesn't seem to be um, distensible enough, we'd go back. This is a classic picture. Of, as you can see, these readings on the left side here, 5.9 millimeters. And when you scope these kids, you, you, it's hard to get the scope through. So you wanna see a little bit of a waste on the, on the right side after the myotomy. We close the uh, myotomy with clips. There's other ways of closing a myotomy. There's overstitch devices, but those are pretty big and sometimes involve a double lumen tube. And if you have a three-year-old, it's not gonna be possible. This is just a short video. Hopefully it'll... Oops. It's just advancing the chair. Wait a second. To just play as I click on it here. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Let's do it more through the slide. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah, let's just play it through this okay. and then go back sure. to the screenshot. Uh, this is a girl actually, one of our early cases, she actually had a cloaca, so she had an appendicostomy. So a lap power was going to be a little more difficult. She'd undergone several dilations and actually Botox. This tube here is an over tube. We don't use this anymore, but basically it's a tube that goes in the mouth. It's very long. It's like 27 centimeters, two centimeters in diameter. You can use it in a teenager, but you're not going to use it in smaller kids because um, it's pretty bulky. So this is just injecting the methylene blue and, and creating a submucosal wheel. This is a little um, a triangle on the blade, which we're creating a mucosotomy. It's interesting. This is an old video, like 20, 2015. Um, it's, it's interesting. When you do a lot more of these cases, you get a little, you know, I take it for granted and you stop videoing or we, we don't edit the videos anymore. But this, this is useful. We do some things differently now. So we insinuate the between these um, submucosal layer and the muscle, and then you create a, a space. So this is called third space endoscopy. And so you can use a cautery to create the space between the submucosa and the muscle. And as you get down towards the G junction, you're going to see bigger blood vessels. In this video, particular video, I, we show some um, cauterization techniques of these vessels, but a lot of times now we just avoid them. So mucosa on the left, muscles on the right, you're going to come out and you're going to see this tunnel. You're going to see the submucosal layer there. And you can see that we've created this tunnel. Once we come back out, it's already a little bit wider open just from making this tunnel, but you do have to cut the muscle. So as you get down here towards the GE junction, you're gonna see bigger blood vessels. What we do differently now, sometimes we just flood this with, with uh, methylene blue, and then you can cauterize these vessels a little more easily. But see how this GE junction is a lot wider open now, just from making the tunnel. We haven't cut any muscle yet. Here we're gonna see some big um, uh, vessels on the, uh, 
on the stomach and you encounter these when you're doing a lap heller and they're, they're pretty irritating. And you, you get or something and put it in there. To, It's a pretty, it's a pretty unique space. And so what you also see here is the, the longitudinal layer we don't cut, uh, obviously, but it's a very thin muscle, very thin. As you know, when you're doing a heller, it's just nothing there. You cut and then all of a sudden you're seeing circular muscle. But you can see the circular muscles splaying out here. and that thin longitudinal layer is right there. Now I can tell you that in um, a lot of the uh, situations in kids or even in adults, um, a lot of gas is transmitted through this longitudinal layer into the chest, to the abdomen. Um, when people started doing POEM about 90%, you know, would get either pneumothoraces, pneumomyostinum, pneumoperitoneum, and they were doing CT scans on post-op day one or scope, scoping on post-op day one, and the, the patients were just sitting there smiling at you. They, there was nothing really you know, wrong with them, and so it's just CO2 that gets into the space. I can tell you that our first 10 to 12 cases, we used air, and the air went everywhere, and the air does not go away, and so one of our early kids came back to the clinic a couple months later and says, when's this air going to get out of my scrotum? We're like, oh, it'll be pretty soon. <laughs> he literally had air for, for a month. Um, so we switched to CO2 and that gets dissolved. But especially in a small kid, even if you, that, that layer, uh, that longitudinal layer in the abdomen, you don't have to treat it interventionally with anything unless there's a, uh, unless there's hemodynamic compromise. Usually if it's a small kid, they'll get a pneumoperitoneum. You just put an angiocath in the umbilicus, drain the air. That's all you need to do. We haven't had to go back uh, to do anything interventionally with any air-related uh, events, although they're, they're, they're fairly common. And so this is just clipping the mucosa closed here at the end. Okay, now I'll go back to that. Go back to the movie. Okay. okay. And so this is the... Uh, the publication last year of our first uh, 37 patients. Uh, 37 primate poems. We did three after failed lap hellers. Two of those kids were from our own series and one was from another hospital. We did one uh, poem after a poem at a, uh, another institution. And most, uh, about half of the patients had prior interventions, whether that patients, Botox or, or both. And so from two to 18 years of age, 39 kilo weight, uh, 11.8 to 107 kilos, 100.7 kilos. The average time was about a, a little over two hours. Um, our very first case took 351 minutes. So that was a, that was a slog, but the patient did very well. Um, length of stay about 2.4 days. What we've done differently with our technique is we've uh, treated with oral nystatin because a lot of these kids will get candida and then you go in there and you can't do the, anything uh, because it's a really infected field and you can't see much. We've also switched entirely to CO2. We uh, have the kids in reverse from Gellenberg. We don't use the over tube anymore. As you can see, it's long and wide. And we nasal tracheal uh, intubate the kids. And we use that triangle knife, as you saw in the video, or we use the Irby knife for the mucos mucosotomy and uh, tunnel and myotomy. And so these are the most common uh, complications, sub-Q emphysema, pneumothorax, pneumomyostinum, pleural fusion, segmental atelectasis, or pneumoperitoneum. Our very first patient, we put a pigtail catheter in her right chest on post-op day number one, but uh, uh, since that, we've never had to intervene um, post-operatively at all. We just do it in the OR if necessary, and that's becoming less frequent. But from this series, nine, nine kids has pneumothoraces, uh, two were treated with pigtails, two with aspiration, pneumoperitoneum in 10, uh, trocar versus aspiration with an angiocath. Uh, mucosotomy means uh, mucosa distant from the mucosotomy, the intended mucosotomy. And we clipped a few of those. Now we wouldn't usually treat that because once that tunnel collapses, there's no space there. So recurrent aphasia occurred in five, um, which is the standard for most of the kids with a, a heller or a poem. And we had one failed poem, which we took uh, was our third kid that we took back and did a lap heller on. 
This is a small child, and you can see where these clips are. Hi, this was a, uh, before our tenth patient, and we were very much trouble getting into the uh, uh, submucosa. And we said, okay, we're just going to clip this and go back another day. So we got a post-op chest X-ray, and you can see the clips are up by the cricopharyngea. So that was that was that. So uh, brought her back a week later, and we're able to do the Heller. So. Um, that, that's just kind of experience. This, this kid was really one of the smallest that we'd done to the date, which is you know, only eight years old. So in this first series, the first 10 patients, 80% 80, 80 had some air-related uh, complication uh, that was managed mostly intraoperatively and decreasing amounts of uh, interoperative complications as the series goes on. But we were also doing more challenging patients, uh, kids after Heller's or kids after other interventions. Um, and time now is like uh, about an hour, uh, a little under two hours. So in this series, 100% uh, had normalization of Eckert scores, 84% after the initial poem, five again required a single balloon dilatation postoperatively. Usually within the first year, you'll see that whether it's a hell or a poem that you need some uh, dilatation or something like that. And again, we had one patient who required a redo uh, Heller after poem. During the same time, we had 10 kids who uh, we did Hellers on. Five chose a Heller over a poem. Three of them were under a year of age, eight, nine, and 10 months. Well, I think now we would probably attempt to do those kids. Three were attempted poems early in the series that we converted to Hellers. One was an uh, attempted poem, a kid who had a Heller that we converted to a redo Heller. And one was a Heller after a failed poem. The first three uh, uh, attempted poems were um, before two, 2017 when we had done less than 10 patients. And so this is those, uh, that group of Heller patients. Again, the last Heller we did was in 2021 in an eight-month-old. Uh, we offered a poem, but the, the parents were wanting a Heller, and they're, they're pretty, you know, pretty, pretty educated. But um, we now would offer poem as initial procedure um, quite standardly. And so we've shown it's effective. We compared that to our prior lap power experience which was the same number of patients, 37. A steep learning curve in the literature, the learning curve is estimated to be about 20 cases with um, relative mastery at 60, as in everything just experience. And this is an updated uh, compilation of patients. We've completed 67 poems. Again, the age range is two to 18, same weight range. 21 children in the series are under 10 years of age. 53 primary poems. Um, nine that had prior Heller, four prior poems. Well, we did one poem in a, in a three-year-old who had an open Heller um, in the past. Uh, operative time about 112 minutes. Length of stay is typically a day, 1.8 days. And again, our distensibility uh, or diameter is um, pre-Heller our, our pre-poem is 7.5 with post 11.5. And our myotomies uh, average 6.4 centimeters. So there's a lot of controversy about poem and reflux. In adults, it's been reported to up to 50% because um, you're not doing any type of anti-reflux procedure. There are places that are doing uh, intraluminal fundal applications. That's a little controversial. We, we definitely want to be careful about this. And we've, we bring all our patients back for, for yearly for um, endoscopy and biopsy. And we've only found the incidence of reflux to be uh, 4%. And so we do two to three biopsies per patient. And our impression after Heller's is they're not, the door fund applications kind of a lousy anti-reflex procedure. So we stopped doing that, but no one, no one brings them back and biopsies them and looks at them. If they're doing well. Like in most cases, you think everyone's, you don't see them again, they're doing great. Maybe they aren't, maybe they are. So we, we, we're very careful about that. If they're gonna to come to us, we, we kind of um, expect them to come back. And most of the kids, even adults are asymptomatic. And in 2019, Inouye had done a consensus, a white paper on uh, reflux and poem. And basically most of it's very treatable with PPIs and does not need some intervention like a, a fundal application uh, following poem. And they're also, he's also tailoring the myotomy to avoid the sling muscles uh, on the stomach. So you're not getting this wide open um, reflux situation. This is just com comparison to Heller and poem. Um, and both are comparable. Uh, most of the studies uh, in kids have been uh, from adult institutions. Uh, over 100 patients of, of four, 14 institutions contributed you know, a few patients per. Um, a single pediatric study out of India had 49 kids. And again, a lot of the uh, institutions don't have a high volume of these. 
And a lot of these own patients, certainly Caldero's group, they brought them back to the operating room a, a day or two later to check. Because a lot of these gas-related events can be scary. If a, if a kid gets distended, you think, oh, what's, what's going on? And most of the time you can manage it with, um, with just aspiration of the air. It's just air. Um, and so that takes, takes time to kind of gain that knowledge. So again, Botox, we don't advocate using Botox in kids because it's just gonna be temporary. It causes a lot more scarring. We've had several kids that had Botox. Uh, makes it a little more difficult, it's doable, but it doesn't really help much. Uh, pneumatic dilatation is okay, but it's definitely been shown to be in, in period of myotomy. Um, lap heller with or without partial fund application has been time tested, but I believe poems that are emerging an excellent alternative with, and better in our experience. So I can just skip ahead here, but we need to continue following up these uh, kids long term because uh, it's important to to have you know good results and and kind of verify that. I'm gonna shift gears here now. Uh, when I first came to DC, I collaborated with one of the bioengineers, uh, and that was one of the things that drew me to DC: the uh, uh, ability to co collaborate with engineers, device development, things like that. We worked on a pyloric uh, balloon, which is still in process. Kind of, we had an engineer who was working on that. Um, but this particular investigator, Raj Shakar, uh, started at University of Maryland, and he did a lot of augmented reality and image fusion technology prior to coming to DC, and basically for laparoscopic surgery. And so the, in laparoscopic surgery, you really can't see inside the organs. So the, the typical benefits of lap surgery, but you can't see the bile ducts. So what we like to do is show us the bile ducts, things below the surface. So just like your first down marker in football, it's augmented reality. It's not there, but it shows you kind of where you need to go to get your first down. You want to be able to see the ducts safely. The original stuff Raj had done um, had really uh, been fixed CT image, images fused onto a, a laparoscopic image. So the preoperative CTs and MRs didn't mimic intraoperative anatomy. And most of the surgery was done in uh, the brain skull based surgery. The spine doesn't move, the brain doesn't move. But in the chest and abdomen, diaphragm moves, the organs move. So it's a lot more difficult to calibrate your instruments to, to record things. So what he did initially in Maryland was he, they did uh, surgeries under a continuous CT. Uh, and they used uh, overlaying live CT images on a laparoscopic video. Um, they weren't using stale images that they had to reproduce. But that's not really practical. So they're showing them operating in a CT scan. On the right side, you see all the monitors which are tracking the instruments, both the laparoscope and the ultrasound or the CT images, but not really practical for, for a surgical uh, situation. And so they take live, they take your laparoscopic display, display CT images and fuse those to get the images on the right here. So a little bit, um, a little bit, um, uh, let's say, uh, basic. And so when he came to children's, uh, we, we discussed you know, moving forward in kids. And I said, we can't really use CT in kids. It's not gonna happen. It's gotta be something different. And he, got, and he had thought always about using all. And so the end point was getting a, a system where we could develop uh, image fusion between ultrasound and endoscopy um, and had a five-year timeline. So we, we use this uh, just by, by chance, a vision test system you could use. Now you can use striker storts, anything. There's, it's not um, committed to a particular device, but we use a vision sensor, which is a 3D, which means you have to wear uh, 3D goggles. And then we just use a standard BK uh, ultrasound device. And so the goal is to fusion is to fuse the lap and ultrasound images to get the picture on the far right where you can see below the surface and do biopsies and resections and things like this. So we tried to optimize the system uh, in, in the lab first. So you, you have these reference trackers, these these big, uh, uh, as you can see on the right screen, these um, trackers on top of the um, laparoscope and the ultrasound device. And this device on the left fuses the image with a lot of uh, complicated uh, bioengineering uh, technology to make, give you the image that you saw before. So in terms of the calibration, very complicated. It really engineers only understand this and they calibrate the instruments so that I'll just skip that. But this was the first generation system. So that um, camera at the top is fit over the over the hospital bed over the patient you have your ultrasound device and then you those images are fused onto the screen let's see another video here so I'm going to just click on it
show the uh, image fusion uh, here. And so you can see the, the, the ducts, arteries on the right hand picture, the red arrows are pointing to the vices. Um, and we validated this in, in kids with lap coli. So we got IRB approval to do this technology in lap coli's. We did it for five minutes and just they were able to um, optimize the technology and improve it over, over several years. A little bit, a little bit bulky. And the thing too is those optical trackers are our top line of sight. So if you turn your hand, the picture goes away. So it's not, not ideal. So we, we, we use this in cases. This is just happened to be a four-year-old girl we we're doing a lap pusto on, and we just kind of used the uh, technology to kind of uh, tw tw tweak it and work it. We didn't make, do any clinical decisions based on this technology because it's really just trial and error to get it to work. But this is quite nice because we could just bovie right down on the pancreas and find this big, huge uh, pancreatic duct and then do our um, pancreatic OJ. And so it was nice, nice to have this, but these are pretty rare cases. I thought this was the, when I first did that case, I thought, oh, wow, this is great. No one's ever done this before. And then, uh, then I go, one of my friends in China, Long Li, had done four of them. But th this, was, this was the youngest kid. So this was, kid was four, and his kids were, I think, a little older. And so the, the clinical feedback from the surgeons on this is that um, the line of sight was a little cumbersome. If, you, if someone put their hand over the, the optical trackers, you lost your image stereoscopic vision system was kind of you know fancy but doesn't really help and you could not uh, track an articulating ultrasound tip so that was kind of a problem so the next generation was uh, electromagnetic based tracking where the um, the trackers are actually closer to the tip of the instruments here it's on the ultrasound probe here it's on the camera or on the trocar of the camera but you can use an op uh, a a a uh, laparoscope that's 30 degree. And this is an electromagnetic field generator. So you have the patient has to be on the center of it. And pretty much everything else is the same. Again, this is with the trackers, which are on the trocar. And all these uh, fancy little objects on here, those are all 3D printed in the lab. Uh, we have a 3D printer. So these guys 3D printed these things. And it's pretty amazing just to, you know, they just kind of think about things like that. But without being in the same building, it's hard to come up with something like this. This is a... This is uh, validating that technology in the lab. So our interventional radiologist had implanted um, little coils into the liver. So we didn't know where they were. So we'd go um, here and find them and then resect them. And so part of this was uh, we were thinking about resectional technology with this, uh, with this uh, device. And we could do resections, uh, segmental resections um, based on the accuracy. And so the, we, we did several of these studies where we try to validate the technology. And again, these orange devices here are the 3D printed uh, devices that are on the, uh, on the actual um, ultrasound and uh, laparoscope. And so what we found or what the, uh, was found after doing a lot of these uh, experiments was that the optical, the electromagnetic tracking was a lot more accurate than the optical tracking. So it's improving every time. So it wasn't ready for prime time yet, but a lot of the work was done in these, uh, in these phantom models where uh, gelatin targets or, or coil targets were put in this gelatin and they, they validated the technology in the lab and got to a point where it was much more accurate. There's some experiments where we used resection without augmented reality. You see the big chunks of liver where you're just kind of like hunking out where you think that coil might be. And with augmented reality, it's a much more precise uh, resection margins. So these experiments, we thought, well, what would be better is to really track a needle because a lot of this technology is going to be more uh, uh, suitable for ablation technology. So you're trying to get into a site and ablate something, not necessarily resect it. And so we thought, well, who does that a lot? And you know, the hepatobiliary surgeons that do the colorectal nets uh, need to track their needles. They use ultrasound in every case. Um, and so we thought about using an RF ablation needle. I talked to um, Dave Geller in Pittsburgh, and he was 
willing to collaborate goes yeah i think that's a good idea you know dave he's like oh yeah let's do that <laughs> and so we we developed it uh the probes to be uh, tracked by a um how this was validated again was phantom gels so the stylus tip on the on the on the um uh, tumor uh, artificial tumor uh was was uh, calibrated with the ultrasound and the uh, laparoscopic image and so this is this is just showing this this technology for this uh, laparoscopic uh, ablation probe and what you can see this is this is kind of cool because you can actually see much better when you track it like kind of guessing okay i think it's in there but on the right you have these markers saying yeah you're in the right spot it's green you're going for it and if you look at the ultrasound image you try to do this without it and this is what the adult biliary surgeons do all the time they're going to find this lesion and do a resection they appear to be possibly enabling technology so this is hot off the press this was presented at sages um last week and so we did a two-center trial um to validate this technology of uh, ablation uh, uh, procedures. We did uh, uh, two arms of the study. Again, the clinical problem was imaging below, uh, the, uh, below the surface and fusing two images so you didn't have to do it in your mind. Again, you saw this before. So again, this is the setup. Similar to before, this is our tracking needle, this is our camera. Um, so pretty much the basic same setup. And so we use storts at Children's uh, and the BK probe, um, UPMC the Striker and the, the BKR 5000 for their ultrasound. And they also use this uh, angiodynamics uh, ablation device. So we got, uh, we got IDE approval to do this um, and IRB approval to do this study. So the ultrasound cam and ablation needle were calibrated preoperatively on the left here. And this is a, this is a complex grid where they can calibrate your ultrasound probe and your laparoscopic probe to work. Sterile processing was a situation where these things had to be calibrated, then processed. So there's a lot of uh, uh, potential problems there. And then assembling the device in the OR, and then the eventual device navigation and visualization. And so we did five coli cystectomy cases at, um, at Children's. Again, this is just showing the you know, ducks and things like that. So we had done this for several years now. So it's kind of just kind of proof of principle and, and feasibility study. Um, and so in, in terms of that, technically successful, we weren't really making decisions about it, but you got to identify the ducts, the confluence of the cystic duct, bile duct. This may be useful if you're, um, as, as a choice over cholangiography or, uh, ICG imaging and could help reduce bile injuries, which is not insignificant still to this day. And UPMC, they did, uh, Dave did, uh, needle localization and ablation in six, six, uh, live cases. Little, little more of a technical challenge. Um, three of the six cases worked very well, and three cases were uh, had failures related to workflow issues. One, uh, when they had sterilely processed the equipment, it became uncalibrated. The the, the ablation needle became uncalibrated, uh, but the potential of placing the needle faster and through uh, planes that are not um, uh, not in a standard approach pass is, is really uh, probably a unique potential um, benefit of this and potential to reduce uh, recurrent uh, tumor at the margins. So this would demonstrate feasibility. Um, you can apply it ac across most lab procedures, could enable, enable safer surgery. This, the system needs to be further simplified, so we're still working on it. Our, our, our next generation basically is to hide the sensors within the device. So they, we've already done this with uh, the ultrasound probe. We've embedded it. Uh, they, they actually took apart an ultrasound probe, which is a pretty big risk to take it apart and get it. I think it's going to work again, but they've been able to do that and work with uh, embedded electromagnetic sensors to, for better tracking. So this is the device they took apart and embedded in here. So it's not in sight and, it, and the, the wire comes out here and senses it. And in terms of uh, validating this, again, the same situation where the, if the sensor is attached externally, it's less accurate um, in terms of registering the target as opposed to when it's internal. So it can get better and better. So what are the benefits potentially reducing bile duct injuries? There's a lot of segmental or suboptimal tumor margins if you're doing a partial organ resection, which may be a benefit in that. 
Uh, again, the, the, the go-to was basically the RF-directed cryo or microwave ablations in liver tumors. And the, the, the chest has been always difficult because with, it, with air in the lungs, ultrasound is not the best technology. So that's something that I think is kind of the, you know, something in the future. But this is a team that worked on all of this and they open up to questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Kane, for a really inspiring talk. Um, I know we have time for a few questions. If anybody in the audience has any thoughts for Dr. Kane. Yeah, Dr. Acton. Yeah. Thank you for thinking of our augmented reality. We help a lot of our neurosurgeons put CT shots in and watch them, you know, take that and give that to uh, mm -hmm. stealth. Yeah. Stealth. Yeah. 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 Right to it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and, and, and you, you, in spine surgery too, they use it all the time to put the pedicle screws and things like that. And they, you know, they don't have to see, it's a lot of 3D. And so it is a very enabling technology potentially. Yeah. yeah. If you use your crystal ball, where do you think, um, how long do you think it'd be before we can get uh, hands on something like that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think, you know, within five years. So I, yeah, I think it's, um, so in our next uh, our next grant, hopefully it's going to be approved, is to uh, you know advance this technology um, because it's right now it's kind of it's it's good, but you know if you ask Dave, he'd say, well, it's okay, but I, you know I'm not going to bet my life on it. He wants to feel them, uh, and so that's where it's going to be good. And as Bob says, in the lung, that would be great because we go in there, we think we're going to do a thoracoscopy, you can't see it, you got to get in there and you feel it, and you feel like five more lesions. So. If that can be kind of improved, the, the problem is that ultrasound in the lung is just a, is a mess. So there has to be something else. I think it, it can't, but if you collapse the lung totally, you can, you can probably get that to work. But, but hopefully it's, uh, yeah, it, it's been a lot of years, it's been 13 years basically. So it's not a, yeah, it's not a short thing. We started this in 2010. <laughs> you can see clunky, clunkiness uh, in the beginning, but now it's, now it's getting better. I, I have one. Oh. I um thank you very much for the the talk. I really enjoyed it. I actually want to go back to your discussion of achalasia mm -hmm. and um, just a comment that ties into our uh, M and M presentation from earlier. That I feel like, and I'm sure it's not just a feeling that our specialty tends to be eroded over time by other um, GI is getting into the achalasia market and and just your thoughts about how surgeons who didn't necessarily train to do some of these things can get their hands on that experience um, because I think that they're also um, kind of cornering the market on getting exposure to those those cases. So how would you know some of our trainees or even me get back yeah. into this um, yeah. this area? That's a great question. I, I think. Um... Like for, for me, I think you, you have to do what you like to do, you know? So there's certain things that are gonna like say, oh, I love this case or other things will be like, mm, not, not so much. And then you typically will do a lot of what you love. And so if you love something, you, you'll go the extra distance to learn how to do it better or do it differently and keep, keep on top of things. Like I say, as Keith Jorgson said, if you're doing things the same, you're probably not advancing. You always have to kind of, you know, do something different, do something better. Um, and so part of that is working with your friends, your, your, your partners, and then, or going outside of your specialty and just seeking out things that you're interested in it's such a broad field. There's so many different things. So, you know, I was always in, interested in esophageal surgery. So that's kind of where I went, you know, with a lot of my interests and yeah, that's, yeah. I could have a comment from online on the
Oh, hi. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Hi, this is uh, Nabil Azim, one of the adult interventional GI folks. Great talk, um, really interesting um, stuff. Uh, you know, I have a lot of experience on the adult side in terms of doing POEM, but um, really I've only had one pediatric case in a in a 12 year old and and as you know from your experience there's a big difference between you know a two-year-old and and some of these older um, pediatric patients where we you know typically just treat them similar to adults i'm curious on the adult side of things we you know our standard in terms of the myotomy is is we go we do the myotomy three to four centimeters on the esophageal body and then about two centimeters on the on the cardia and that seems to be enough to disrupt the LES and and achieve clinical success but I'm, I'm curious you know does that make sense for for a two-year-old um you know to be doing such a long myotomy and and what your approach is and, and and also you know what um what changes you do for for some of these smaller smaller patients yeah, good, good, good points. We um, so we use a standard scope. So we use the uh, the one ninety, but it's the nine point two millimeter. So it's smaller. It's not the nine point nine, but the same dissecting cap. Uh, in terms of the myotomy, we typically would go two centimeters on the on the on the cardia and three to four on the esophagus. In the smaller kids, it's more like a kind of a a feel. Um, you may not want to go two centimeters on on the cardia because it's just you're going to be it's going to be just wide open. Um, so it's more, we, we pass the scope in and out a few times out of the tunnel to just kind of see what it looks like. And once we see, whoa, this looks like it's pretty open. Uh, we don't want to create a, we don't want to ever see a straight tube on our endo flip because then that's just a reflux prep. But uh, interestingly, we, we don't see the, we're not seeing the reflux that would be, you would expect. And I think because they have such, uh, I mean, this is a, the problem with kids is dysphagia. I think it's more challenging to do the smaller kids because you can't do 10 centimeters above the GE junction. Sometimes there's only five. And so you have to be pretty precise in getting in the tunnel. Otherwise you're gonna be at the GE junction or your mucosa will tear. And so that's just uh, experience, but yeah, it's more, uh, and we use the endo flip quite liberally to, to tailor our myotomies. Um, so it, with, whereas in teenagers or, or bigger kids, we could say, yeah, two on the stomach and you know, three or four on the, on the esophagus. So that, that's our, but that, that's what we do in peds though. We, we do, you know, kids that are two kilos and then a hundred kilos the same day. So we're just used to it. Hi, uh, my name is Amit Bhargav. I'm one of the thoracic surgeons here and uh, work pretty closely with Nabil uh, on these kinds of cases. Um, thank you for your talk. I, in terms of our approach, we decided a few years ago now um, that our adult patients would preferentially go for POEM. Uh, and we've kind of pretty much shut down our, our hellers uh, unless patients have a strong preference for surgery. Uh, and then um, I think probably in the last three years, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Nabil, we've maybe had one or two patients that have been referred to us for fund application after um, so it's been interesting, you know, in terms of thinking about getting involved. I think uh, we've worked really well with our GI colleagues to allow them to really flourish with that practice. And then we, we kind of move on to other things. One of the um, interesting things about your presentation was really the focus on air in cavities, whether it's the mediastinum, the chest, or the belly, uh, and describing them as complications. And I wonder if, as the field moves forward, those should not be considered complications, unless there's a pneumothorax, I would consider right. that a complication. But pneumomediastinum, pneumoperitoneum are really just expected uh, potential uh, consequences of doing the procedure and aren't complications in the sense that they need an intervention. And that would certainly you know, I, it sounds like most of the parents that you talk to aren't too worried about things like that, but that would certainly change how we think about POEM in kids and really decrease your complication profile because they really aren't. So, you know, if that's 30% of your complications, you now have a procedure that looks a lot better. Uh, and from a, 
internal marketing perspective to other physician specialties, it might be a more interesting way of thinking about it. Well, I, I to totally agree. Uh, I think, um, we describe those complications as potentially happening. They're, they're less frequent now, but our radiologists that we used to get esophagrams post-op, uh, we don't do that anymore. We just say, you know, and 100% would have pneumoperitoneum. And now they read expected pneumoperitoneum after poem. So they, you know, so you're right. It's just, it's not really a, they can be called complications or gas related events, but of no clinical consequences. So uh, there was a lot of um, angst in the beginning with poem about uh, these things happening. And uh, what we have in kids is the kids will desaturate, you know, if you're a three-year-old eventually gets distended, you know, as you're doing your poem, and then you put the scope in the stomach, decompress it, they don't get better. They're desatting, just put an angiocath in and they're fine. You just finish the procedure and then that's it. And then you put some dermabond on it and tell the parents we had to put an angiocath in there and they're like, okay. And there's no, uh, no downside. The tunnel collapses, it's, it's pretty unique. I don't know if you're familiar with either uh, the full thickness myotomy that you know, there's in, in China, they've been doing just a posterior myotomy all the way through. I, I don't know about that. I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, uh, bold, but I don't think we would ever do that. But uh, people do it. I have another question. On are you are you anticipating that annual endoscopy will be needed post home definitely? Will they be spaced out down the road? Frequency of anesthesia and the consequence post home versus Heller is another thing I think about. Yeah. So good. Good point. Um, we actually want to um, do endoscopy on our hellers because no one's really looked at it, and especially not in kids. So I don't think the the risk of anesthesia uh, is that is that significant. We would we, our plan is to do it one, every year for three years and then kind of as needed, um, and depending on the age too. So we would definitely space it out. But I think with a new technique, I think it's just more careful that we validate the results and, and continue to do endoscopy. But we've also talked about no one's ever looked at their hellers after, you know, what they, do they have reflux? Do they not? They're, you know, so that, that would be interesting to see too. So I'm, I'm thankful for um, uh, Dr. Azim's comments and Dr. Bargava, thanks for chiming in too. I think you're right. I mean, it's, it really is a collaborative effort. There's a chance for, um, moving on this market in a way that's safe because we can do it together. You know, um, Nabil, when you helped with our pediatric patient, there was a lot of discussion in our group and this patient, Dr. Hess, was also taken care of. And I can tell you as uh, someone who's managed a 18-month-old with achalasia, with congenital achalasia, pretty severe, we really deliberated on timing. And she got a lap heller with a door. And I've talked to you about this case, Tim, as mm -hmm. she's a chronic patient in my clinic. And maybe I'll start with taking her door. Maybe I'll send her to DC. Yeah. So you can pull. But, um, you know, really grateful for the time that you took today to spend with us. We've got a, just a plaque to um, oh, wow. just recognize oh, uh, so the much. contributions you make in our field. And we're just grateful for your time to come to the University of Minnesota today. So thanks, thanks everybody. Have a great day. We had March 14th earlier, but today's curriculum consists of for the senior core, I think, um, oral board prep. Is that right? Okay, so we'll do that with you, Dr. Kane. Okay. And then for the junior, the junior core curriculum, have a great day, everybody.